Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to thank each of you for joining with us for today's Sunday School Bible Study coming from Charlene's Outreach Ministry. We have a wonderful and powerful lesson for today. What can we learn from Solomon's life? What can we learn from Solomon's life? We are going to look at some of the things that Solomon did through this passage of scripture and see how can it help us to move forward in being more wise in uh, guidance and leadership and a deeper understanding of faith. We will look into the most profound man known for his wisdom. Uh, uh, Solomon was known for, to be the wisest man that ever lived. So we want to look at some of the things that he leaves us to, to be able to be wise and, and, and have a good understanding of how to lead, whether we're leading our family or leading on a job, how to do it wisely, but also had faith, faith which allowed him to move forward in his personal growth. So we want to get ready to learn how to move forward in our personal growth as we look at Solomon's life today. Our focus verse for today is 1 Kings 3, verse 9. It is a, a legendary uh, passage of scripture. It, the scripture lesson takes read, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thou so great a people? Which is so powerful and so true. Solomon was uh, uh, about to be, it was ahead over uh, hundreds of thousands of people, possibly a few million of people. And so he wanted an understanding. He was young and he wanted uh, the best uh, out for outcoming to come forth. So he went to God, the one that can give true wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Our truth about God, God's wisdom contains every blessing we need. God's wisdom contains every blessing. Our lesson text is coming from 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5 to 28. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse, verse 5 to 28. As they say, get your Bible and follow along with me as we go forward. Okay? We're going to get ready to move into our lesson, but of course, we are going to have prayer. Then we'll move into our lesson. Dear God in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that you are an awesome and wonderful God. We thank you for who you are, not just for what you do. We give you the honor, the glory, and praise. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done, you is doing, and you shall do in each of our life, Father. We thank you for making a way out of nowhere. We thank you for leading and guiding us in your true path of righteousness. Father, we ask you at this time to forgive us of our sins and help us to do that which is good and right in your sight, Father. Help us to repent and true return from our ways that is not like you in the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we go before we come before you this day. Uh, asking you that you would open our eyes that we see and our ears that we hear and give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in your word, Father, as we study your word, that we may be more proficient doers of your word and not just hearers only in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we go forward, your, your word says that by your stripes we are healed and we claim healing, deliverance, protection, and guidance for each and every person at the sound of my voice and whenever this is heard in Jesus precious and mighty name. Lord, we we, we claim uh, uh, deliverance from depression and anxiety. We claim deliverance from uh, uh, pain and At this time, the people of Israel were sacrificing on the high places, engaging in a pagan, pagan practice. They learned from their Canaanite neighbors that was in violation of the Mosaic law, Leviticus 17, verse 3 and 4. And like I was saying, that's in, this is why I was saying it. He could have been up there, not in the area where they were sacrificing, but it's likely that he was. But despite following these pagan practices, Solomon loved the Lord by walking in the statues of his father, David. Now, one thing I want to say about this, we see on several occasions that it is mentioned that Solomon follows his father, David's footsteps. How do he follow his father's footsteps? By going and praying to God and doing the things that he saw his father do uh, uh, unto the Lord. 
Well, we want to live a life that not only speaks to our family, speaks to our children uh, of what they should do, but be an example that they have to follow. And that way, as Solomon had David as an example because he saw what he did, so can our family and children see what we do and make a difference in their lives. Uh, scripture lesson text for verses five through nine reads, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God act, see it, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge? this great people of yours. Solomon's response showed that in one sense, he was already wise beyond his years. He was about 20 when he became king. The young man recognized it in his inadequacies. He had no experience in leadership, yet he had been made ruler of a numerous people. In verse 7 and 8, what he needed was a receptive heart to judge and lead them well. The first step toward becoming a kingdom man is to realize your desperate need for God. And the first step to becoming a kingdom person is realizing our need for God. We must realize that we need God in all areas of our life. And as we go to him and seek him, then he will guide us and lead us. Amen. Verses 10 through 15 reads, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you or no shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings of your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I was lifting your days. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered a burnt offering, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. We see here that Solomon, first of all, he realized his inadequacy as a young man uh, to lead that larger group of people. Then he also uh uh, we, I believe, I truly believe that when you dream something, it's something that is within you. It's within your, your, within your mind, your soul, and your spirit. You have a deep desire for this. So to have a dream, and God asks you, "What do you want?" and you answer him by saying, "I need wisdom. I need understanding. I can't do this alone." By doing so shows that he truly had a deep desire to do what God would have him to do and to get assistance in doing so because it was so deep in him that it was the first thing that he said to God when he asked him, what do you want from me? God was so pleased that Solomon asked for wisdom 
you see James 1 and 5, rather than long life or riches, that he granted the request and added to it what Solomon did not ask for, riches, honor, and a long life, uh, verses 10 to 14. But for these promised blessings to be reality, Solomon would have to walk in the Lord's ways and keep his statutes and commands. God promises were sure, but they had to be accessed by obedience. Solomon responded to the encounter with worship and feasting. Now we know, we we see here, this is one of the, 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 the things that brings out what it takes to be a good leader, what it takes to be, uh, uh, to walk in the statutes of the Lord and realize some of God's uh, uh, blessings has stipulations on them. Some of God's blessings has stipulation on them. And do you know what that stipulation is? Are you following that stipulation and you are asking for something? You are saying that my prayer has not been answered. Are you uh, doing what is required to receive that blessing because there are some blessings that are offered in the Bible. You don't get them just by walking up and saying, I want a blessing. Verse 16 says, now two women were harlots came to the king and stood before him. The story appearing in this section was clearly intended by the author of 1 Kings to demonstrate the profound wisdom that God had granted uh, Solomon. It helps to helps us to see that having wisdom does not involve the mere acquisition of knowledge and understanding. You can have all the knowledge of a situation and still not have the understanding of the wisdom to guide to to, to manage it correctly. Brother, wisdom is spiritual understanding applied to earthly living. God had given Solomon not just smart, but also the ability to see the world from a spiritual perspective and apply that perspective to life. The book of Proverbs written mostly by Solomon is for the demonstration that God had blessed the king with the ability to put spiritual truth into action. And this is what we want to do, is to learn how to put spiritual truth into action of our daily lives. And what does it take to put spiritual truth in our life? Number one, it takes prayer. It takes meditation. It takes uh, 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 going to God. It takes uh, 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 being uh, consistent and obedient to God, amen? Verse 17 to 22 reads, and one woman said, oh, my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then it happened the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth and we were together. No one was in the house except the two of us in the house. What she's saying here is that no one else could have exchanged the babies besides her. Nobody else could have did this but her because when nobody there but me and her, and I know I didn't do it, so it had to be her. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. And she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your maid servant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose them in the morning, so to nurse my son, there he was dead. But when I had examined him in the morning, indeed, he was not my son whom I had born. I truly believe that what had, what, she, what happened, in, and I understand what she's saying, but that the woman, uh, uh, when she first saw the child, she you know, just accepted it because it was probably half dark and 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 one quite all the way morning. But after she woke up and truly began to look at this child, wait a minute, this is not my baby here, amen. So she that's why she she realized that this was not her. And said, then the other woman said, no, but the living one is my son and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, no, but the dead one is your son and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. This is the argument they pulled backwards and forward in front of the king about who baby was who. 
So there, there was truly no exact way to tell uh, uh, which one of them was lying. And so the king served served as Israel's one man Supreme Court, the last level of appeal in difficult cases. Imagine none of the rest of the people uh, that looked at cases could deal with that because it was not a, a direct uh, uh, answer to it. It said this particular case involved a dilemma between two women who were prostitutes. Each had given birth to a child in verse 17 and 18, the first woman claimed that the child of the second woman had died because she lay on him while sleeping. Then while it was still night, the second woman placed her dead son next to the first woman and took her living son for herself. When the first woman woke to find the child next to her dead, she recognized that he wasn't her son. The second woman vigorously denied it and claimed the exact opposite. I said, I truly believe uh, uh, they knew each other's habits and how the other woman knew how she maybe slept wild or something. And so with doing so, she decided that you must have got on that baby and, 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 and smothered while you were asleep because you sleep wild anyway or something, you know, of that nature. But uh, uh, with doing so, there was no way of telling whose baby was actually who. Because they both could have been lying. 23 to 26, it says, and the king said, the one says, this is my son who lives, uh, who lives, and your son is the dead one. And the other says, no, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. When the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yawned with compassion for her son and say, and she said, oh my Lord, give her the living child and by no means kill him. But the other said, let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. Like the king said, she, you can tell, we can tell here that this woman really wasn't her child, or even if it had been her child, she didn't need it because she had no more care for the child than to be willing to allow the child to be killed. It's a left without the help of a DNA test, or either, even a polygraph test that we have nowadays. The average judge would be stumped by the case, and although we know that all polygraph tests don't come out correct, but this with this God given insight into the ways of human nature, Solomon knew just what to do. He said to cut the living baby in two and give half to each woman. And just as, as the king knew what happened, the child's true mother begged for the baby's life and was even willing to give him up. The other woman cruelly second the king's decision. Go on and kill the little buzzard. And, and, and it just might as well say, go on and kill him. And 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 and, and neither one of us will have him. And she was just that cruel about the whole situation. We look and see here the value of wisdom. One of the things that we will look at is the value of wisdom. Solomon requests for wisdom from God instead of material wealth or power highlights the enduring importance of wisdom in our life in a world filled with distractions seeking wisdom and understanding can guide us in making better decisions. Okay, verse 27 and 28 reads, <clears throat> So the king answered and said, Give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him. She is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Looking at uh, Solomon's decision that he made to to bring about a a, a a end to the situation, he offered to, to kill the child. Just was to say, cut him in half and give one to, a half to each person. But the the true mother of the child was willing to even give up the child rather than have the child uh, killed at any means. His unique solution to the dilemma rewarded Solomon 
rewarded, Solomon gave the living baby to the first woman. In verse 27, the account quickly made the rounds in Israel so that everyone stood in awe of the king because they saw that God's wisdom was in him to carry out justice. Solomon's reputation as the wisest man who'd ever lived spread quickly and it brought glory to God. I mean, I can imagine that it began there and it just increased, increased. I don't imagine the first thing that happened was what had uh, brought them to say he was the wisest man. But as they began to see him to continue to use his wisdom and knowledge and understand that he received from God, then he was able to, they, they were able, they spread it more and more that he was the wisest man that ever lived. So what can we learn from Solomon that will help us? The first thing is the power of humility. Solomon's humility in acknowledging his need for wisdom serves as a reminder that humility is a virtue that opens the door and to growth and learning. Being open to seeking guidance and learning from others is essential in our journey. And as I spoke of earlier, I truly believe he had really been meditating and thinking about uh, how he was going to get wisdom and understanding to 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 lead those people. Because when he had the when he went to sleep and had the dream and was asked the question, he was able to go right straight to what he wanted from God. Number two is the consequences of compromise. Late in his life, Solomon made compromises and alliances that went against God's commandment. This led to trouble and division in his kingdom. We can learn from this that compromising our values can have negative consequences, and it will have negative consequences in our life if we compromise. As they say, uh, Solomon had at least a thousand wives and concubines, and even though he started out getting wives uh, by to make peace with the nations, it still was a compromise because they were, uh, as kings especially, and, and the Jewish people were not supposed to have uh, uh, several wives. Number three, leadership and responsibility. Solomon's wise judgment in the case of the two women and the baby underscores the importance of fair and justice leadership. Today, leaders can draw inspiration from this example in making decisions that benefit the greater good, not just the easy one out, but the greater good. Okay, number four, the role of faith and devotion. Solomon's dedication to building the temple in Jerusalem demonstrates the importance of faith and devotion in one's life. It reminds us of the significance of our spiritual practices and commitments. And if I'm not mistaken, that the building the uh, uh, temple was one of the first things that he built. And he quickly got on that task because he knew that was a very, of, of utmost importance uh, to build the temple of God. Legacy and impact is number five. Solomon's reign is often remembered as a period of peace and prosperity for Israel. We can learn about the lasting impact of leadership and the importance of leaving a positive legacy for future generations. So as we are incorporating these lessons from Solomon's into today, we want these teachings can provide valuable insights for each of us seeking personal growth, guidance in leadership, and a deeper understanding and a deeper walk in faith. This is a wonderful and powerful lesson. I pray you meditate on this lesson and have a great and blessed day. God bless you.